Now to the week in Washington. President Biden facing a stalled agenda and dropping poll numbers will this week face reporters in a rare formal news conference, just the 10th of his presidency and coming on the eve of his first year in office. Heading into the midterms, Republicans hope to seize the moment and borrow from the playbook laid out by Glenn Youngkin, sworn in Saturday as the 74th governor of the state of Virginia, flipping political control of a state that Joe Biden won by 10 points, little more than a year ago. As I come to this moment and to this office knowing that we must bind the wounds of division, restore trust, find common cause for the common good, and strengthen the spirit of Virginia. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin joins us now exclusively from Richmond in his first television interview since taking office. Governor, welcome to Fox News Sunday. I, I wanted to start you off with reaction to the events yesterday in Texas. Uh, by virtue of the fact that you signed an executive order combating anti-Semitism as one of your first orders of business. Now, we still do not know uh, the full background of these events, but the gunman did attack a synagogue, and the woman that he wanted to have released from custody is an avowed anti-Semite. There's also the Virginia connection of the FBI hostage rescue team from Quantico being down there to help resolve this. So if we could start off, Governor Yunkin, with your thoughts on what happened yesterday. Well, good morning, John, and I'm coming to you from the great Commonwealth of Virginia. And yes, one of the first things we did yesterday was sign an executive order to press forward with Virginia being a leader in combating uh, the, the, uh, anti, the uh, combating with anti-Semitism commission and laws to make sure that Virginia is, in fact, the safest place for everyone to live and work and raise a family. We've seen, we've seen animosity and hatred towards the Jewish community on the rise. And we're just not going to stand for it in Virginia or in this country. There is no place for it. And Virginia will be a leader when it comes to standing up for religious freedom and combating hatred. In your first day on the job, uh, Governor, you signed uh, 11 executive actions. Nine of those were executive orders, two executive directives. You kicked off your inauguration at the reconciliation statue there in Richmond. Reconciliation, also a theme of your inaugural address. We played a little bit of it earlier when you said, no matter who you voted for, I pledge to be your advocate, your voice, your governor. But there is a large slice of Virginia voters who back Terry McAuliffe, governor, who see you as an acolyte of President Trump, who they very strongly disagreed with. What will you do to ensure that those voters know that you will be an advocate for them? Well, what we heard from voters on November the 2nd, from all voters, not, not Republicans versus Democrats, but from Virginians, was that they're ready for a new way forward. We won the independent vote. We had droves of, of Democrats come across mm -hmm. the aisle. We, in fact, saw Virginians come together who've never been in the same room together, forever Trumpers and never Trumpers. We won, the, we won the Hispanic vote and the Asian vote. We had a greater percentage of the black vote than any Republicans gotten in, in, uh, in recent memory. Mm -hmm. What this demonstrates to me is that Virginians are ready for a new direction. We're going to stand up for low taxes and re to reestablish our high expectations in our schools and get politics out and those critical, critical math, science, and reading skills that we need for our children to be college ready or career ready. We're gonna get crime down by comprehensively investing in law enforcement. We're gonna get this economy moving so we create opportunity for all Virginians. And we're gonna stand up for the rights protected under our constitution that we hold dear. It's a new day in Virginia and Virginians spoke loudly. They want a new direction, and this is what we delivered mm. yesterday on day one. You know, it's, it's no uh, surprise that you were in a school there, Governor, because uh, part of the uh, credit for your victory there in Virginia uh, went to your stance on schools. In fact, one of your first two executive orders was to, quote, end the use of divisive concepts in public education, including critical race theory, and to give parents the choice of whether their kid wears a mask in school. I want to get to the critical race theory in a moment, but first to the issue of masks. Uh, there's some concern that if parents start to tell their children to take off the masks, or if school districts say masking is optional, that it will run afoul of a law that was passed by the Virginia legislature, which dictates that the schools have to follow closely CDC guidance. Can, can you give comfort to parents at home and to school boards who might opt out that if they do, you'll have their back? Well, 
We said all along that we were going to stand up for parents. Because let's just be clear. What's happened over the last few years is that the bureaucrats and politicians have absolutely stopped listening to parents. And in Virginia, it is clear under law that parents have a fundamental right to make decisions for their children's upbringing, their education, and their care. And so we are providing parents an opt-out. We're providing them the ability to make the right decision for their child with regards to their child's well-being. Mm -hmm. We are going to use all the authority that, that I have to consider all options to protect that right. And I think this is exactly what Virginians voted for in November and we delivered yesterday. Let me move on to critical race theory because this was a huge flashpoint in the November election. Again, part of the reason uh, that you're credited with the victory uh, there in the Commonwealth. It'll likely be a big issue in the midterms as well. Uh, critics of your position, and, and you sign an executive order again that would, quote, end the use of divisive concepts in schools, which is an allusion to critical race theory. Critics of your position, including former President Obama, say, look, critical race theory is not being taught in schools and that this was merely a, a, a trumped up phony culture war. What do you say to that? And, and what does your executive order actually do in terms of critical race theory? Well, anyone who thinks that the concepts that actually underpin critical race theory are not in our schools, hasn't been in our schools. And oh, by the way, I think the school systems in Virginia, and particularly in Loudoun County, have been doing everything they can to try to, try to obfuscate the fact that the curriculum has moved in a very, very opaque way that has hidden a lot of this from parents. And so we are, in fact, are going to increase transparency so that parents can actually see what's being taught in schools. And we have instructed our, our Board of Education I have instructed our Secretary of Education, our State Superintendent of Public Schools, to review the curriculum and get racially divisive and other divisive teaching concepts out of the school system. Mm. We're not going to teach our children to view everything through a lens of race. Yes, we will teach all history, the good and the bad, because we can't know where we're going unless we know where we have come from. But to actually teach our children that one group is advantaged and another is disadvantaged simply because of the color of their skin cuts across everything we know to be true. And the immortal words of Dr. Martin Luther King ring in our ears that mm. we must judge one another by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. But this is what will be the founding principle of our executive order, what we're going to do in Virginia schools. But, Governor, just so I've got it straight here, is, is it your contention that critical race theory is being taught in Virginia public schools? There's not a course called critical race theory. All of the principles of critical race theory, the fundamental building blocks of actually accusing one group of, of being, being oppressors mm -hmm. and another of being oppressed, of actually burdening children today for, for sins of the past, for teaching our children to judge one another yeah. based on the color of their skin, yes, that does exist in Virginia schools today, and that's why we have Passed that we have, I signed the executive order yesterday to make sure that we get it out of our schools. So I asked the question about the courses in critical race theory because, again, that's a contention of critics that there are no courses on critical race theory that are being taught in Virginia public schools. And Scott Maneo, who is a member of Parents Against Critical Race Theory, has this message uh, for you, Governor. He says, promising to ban CRT is empty unless he, the governor, is willing to publicly state that he will also ban the tenets of CRT, as CRT is only a framework. So will you ban the tenets of CRT, and, and how do you ensure as you just said, that we will teach all of our history, the good and the bad, in a fair way. Well, first of all, that's exactly what we did yesterday, was we actually went at the tenets of CRT. We went at the tenets of racially divisive concepts, because that's exactly where the underpinning of CRT is embedded in, embedded in our schools in Virginia. Mm. We absolutely have to recognize that what the left liberals do here is try to obfuscate this issue by saying there's no course called critical race theory. Well, of course there's not in elementary school. 
But in fact, there are absolutely the tenants of CRT present in the schools, and that's what our executive order went at yesterday. Now, let me ask you about this rape in Loudoun County. It was actually a couple of rapes. Your fourth executive order that you put out yesterday, you promised to investigate wrongdoing in Loudoun County. I expect that's an allusion to the, uh, the rape that occurred late in the school year before the summer break. Last year, uh, the boy that was accused of raping Scott Smith's daughter and one other young woman was sentenced to supervised probation last week. Here's what Scott Smith, the father of the daughter, said uh, very recently. Listen here. I suggest you listen to me loud and clear. Pay attention to what's happened here in Loudoun because it's coming to your community next. What, in fact, will this investigation be looking into? Well, we're going to be looking into the entire circumstances around the decisions that were made to actually move this young man from one school to another, to not inform parents, to not inform the community, and oh, by the way, clearly to put other students in say, in, in, at risk for their safety. There's one fundamental tenet between government and those that we serve, which is to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to our children, it is paramount that our school systems live up to that value. And what we see here is that there is strong, strong, strong evidence that, in fact, it was not only uh, not taken, taken seriously in Loudoun County, it was hidden. Yeah. And so we've asked Attorney General Meares to go to work. We're going to get full transparency, and we're going to make sure that we hold this school board accountable for the decisions that were made. Now, in terms of holding them accountable, do you think that people need to be fired? I think people should have, I think people should have already resigned. And my clear sense is that once the full scope of what happened here is well understood, there will be resignations. And I do believe that there has been dereliction of duty, and so all actions in order to hold this this school board accountable should be taken. Let me ask you about the vaccine mandate for, for coronavirus, because this was the subject of, of a uh, landmark Supreme Court ruling last week. You have said that you will challenge the vaccine mandate for health workers in facilities that receive federal funding. But the majority of the Supreme Court justices, which included some conservative leaning justices, said that such a mandate, quote, fits neatly within the power given to HHS by Congress. Are you still going to challenge the mandate? Is that your plan? And, and how will you get around the SCOTUS's ruling? Well, let me start with the fact that I was very pleased by their ruling on the OSHA mm -hmm. mandates. And I think it fully reflects the fact that we should not, should not be penalizing people by forcing employers to fire folks who don't get the vaccine. To be clear, I am a strong advocate for the vaccine. I've gotten the vaccine, I've gotten the booster, my wife's gotten the vaccine, she's gotten the booster. We think it's the best way to keep your family safe. But we also believe that it's an individual decision that should be left to people to make with regards to their own health. In the circumstances with Virginia's hospital system, we're in a crisis. There's an executive order that's currently in effect to allow hospitals to, in fact, have much more flexibility with regards to their staffing protocols and how they're handling patients. We need to do this because there is a surge going on in COVID-19 hospitalizations. Yeah. I'm disappointed, disappointed in the ruling from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has ruled. And so we're going to have to go to work to make sure that we don't have a further depletion of the resources that are in our hospital system, because right now, one of the most important things we can do is try to expand capacity in Virginia's hospitals so that those people who need sure. care can get it. Sure, I understand, but is it still your plan to challenge the mandate? Well, I think at this point the Supreme Court has ruled. Yeah. And so we, in fact, are going to go to work to make sure that every power that I have as governor is being brought to bear to give the hospitals the flexibility they have to make sure that we have the staffing we need to, to make sure that we have the, op, the, the, uh, the intensive care mm -hmm. facilities and, and availability in our hospital to treat Virginians. This is a big moment for us in Virginia because we are seeing a surge in certain parts of Virginia. We have to make sure the hospitals are prepared. Sure. You know, one, one of the aspects of this, too, is that there's a lot of schools that are going back to remote learning. Uh, just over 53 percent of the schools in Virginia are open for full-time learning. And you have said in, in the past that school closures have caused too many setbacks for Virginia's children. And it's shameful that politicians in Richmond continue to bow to special interests instead of doing what's best for children. Hugh Hewitt thinks that you should go out there and write a new emergency declaration that says you've got to be back in school. Are you prepared to do that? 
Well, we have, we, there's legislation moving through our uh, General Assembly that in fact says absolutely that, that schools must, ha must mm -hmm. be open five days a week. Um, that in fact, virtual learning is, is a, a, a tool of last resort. Mm -hmm. And right now we need to get our kids back in school. I also think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to revise the protocols that we are using when a child is exposed, but showing no symptoms in school. And test to stay is an incredibly important tool for us. But the challenge we have, of course, is we don't have enough testing kits. And here we are in January dealing with a surge and we don't have enough testing kits. And yeah. so we're doing everything we can within our, within our Department of Health and Human Resources to expand testing mm -hmm. availability to our schools, but also to those areas where we have those Virginians that in fact are most vulnerable and particularly elderly. Yeah. We should not see a testing deficiency right now in Virginia is one of my big frustrations as we head into the administration. Yeah, not just a problem there in the Commonwealth, but across the country as well. Let me ask you quickly about politics in the time that we have left. You really walked a shrewd line here. Uh, you embraced President Trump's policies, former President Trump to a degree, but at the same time kept him at arm's length enough that you didn't alienate moderate voters and many Democrats who you needed uh, to win. Is, is this a roadmap, do you believe, for other Republicans in the November election? Well, what we did in Virginia over the last year was give everyone a great big bear hug. <laughs> and we, in fact, embraced all Virginians. And I've said before that I so deeply appreciated President Trump's support. We brought together a coalition of folks that had never been in the room together, forever Trumpers and never Trumpers, yeah. moderates, Democrats. We, we campaigned places that, for, that Republicans have historically not campaigned, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. resulted in record vote, vote levels in all minority communities. What we demonstrated is that this is about bringing people together. And yes, there are many things that people disagree about, but there is so much more that we agree upon. And when it comes to getting taxes down and yeah. getting our schools refocused on, ec on excellence and getting politics out of the school and investing in law enforcement and standing up to fight crime and making sure we have a great economy and we're protecting the rights that are guaranteed under our Constitution, these, are, these, aren't, these aren't values that are shared only by a political party. These are universal values shared by Virginians. Well, and so that great big bear hug, I think, is, is the path forward that we as Republicans can build a bigger tent and we can embrace all Virginians because the opportunity in Virginia is for all. Yeah, well, de definitely is a roadmap for many other candidates. Uh, one last question, if I could, about the weather. You've got a big storm about to dump on Virginia there. Uh, Ralph Northam, on his way out the door, uh, signed an emergency declaration that gives you the power to do most anything that you want to do within reason to address the situation. How are you going to make sure that Senator Tim Kaine and some other people don't spend 24 hours on I-95 when the storm hits? Well, we're well prepared. The National Guard's been deployed, and uh, our Virginia Department of Transportation has relocated assets from the eastern part of the state to the western part of the state where we see the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. We've been out pre-treating all the roads, and I think we've done a great job communicating with Virginians to not travel today. Stay home, and uh, let's let this storm come and go, and we're going to be ready and take great care of Virginians. All right. Well, my, my wife and son and Jennifer Griffin and her son are coming back from a lacrosse tournament in Virginia Beach, so... Hopefully, they'll either make it or spend an extra night in Virginia Beach. We'll see. Governor Youngkin, it's been an important weekend for you. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Right. Thank you for having me, and I hope your, t your son's team wins in Virginia Beach. But if they stay an extra day, Virginia's a great place to have to spend an extra day. All right. Appreciate it. And just for the record, I am a constituent as well. Uh, Governor Youngkin, thank you.